Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation um, with authors of Whiteness is Not an Ancestor, Essays on Life and Lineage by White Women. Today's event is sponsored by Another Story Bookshop. Um, we're grateful to this independent bookstore located in Toronto, Ontario for over 30 years. This is the third of six conversations in this online series developed by CAB Publishing featuring essayists Carol Harmon and Pam Emerson and editor Lisa Iverson. Each event is with contributors from Canada, the US and UK who have written essay essays for this anthology about the role of whiteness in their lives and generational family histories. Whiteness is not an ancestor has just been selected by the editors of Kirkus Reviews to be featured um, indie title in their current November 15th magazine issue, a recognition received by less than 10% of their reviewed new publications. We're also very grateful to Devyani Saltzman for moderating today's conversation. Devyani is a Canadian writer and curator with deep interest in relevant multidisciplinary programming at the intersection between art, ideas, and social change. She's the director of the public programming at AGO, working across all disciplines and was previously the director of literary arts at the Banff Center, the first woman and the first woman of color in that role, as well as a founding curator at Luminato, North America's largest multi arts festival. Her work has appeared in the Globe and Mail, National Post, The Atlantic, and Tehelka, India's weekly of arts and investigative journalism. She sits on the boards of the Writers' Trust of Canada, OAAG and Summer Works Performance Festival, and has been a juror for the National Magazine Awards, Canada Council of the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, and the Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for Nonfiction. Saltzman has a degree in anthropology and sociology from Oxford. My name's Summer. I am also one of the SES in the book, and I will be monitoring the Q&A um, and the chat. Um, if you have a question you would like to propose to uh, the panelists, uh, please put it in the Q&A. And um, during the last 10 minutes, I'll pop in to read questions and comments from the group. With that, Devyani, take it away. Thank you, Summer, and uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge where we are. We are actually all in different places. So before each speaker speaks, we're going to acknowledge the territories we are we are currently in. I am in Takaranto, and Takaranto operates on the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably care for the land around the Great Lakes. I'd also like to thank Another Story, our amazing bookstore here in Toronto for sponsoring this event. They actually are also our bookseller at the AGO and an amazing community-minded bookstore and to Sonia Lee for the invitation to be here. Uh, just to give everyone a sense of flow, these are two incredible essays and um, an amazing collection. It could take, we could be here for hours because there is so much to unpack. So in terms of flow, we're going to start with um, short bios and introductions, and then Carol and Pam are going to do a brief reading. And uh, then we're going to have a conversation with some pointed questions to each essay, and then open it up more widely before the Q&A. So without further ado, Carol Harmon is a poet, memoirist, photographer, and performer. She has a mixed media career as an actress, photographer, publisher, retailer, building manager, and writer. Very talented. She hails from Banff in the Canadian Rockies, but now lives in Half Moon Bay on the west coast of Canada, traditional land of the Shishal Nation, to whom she's exceedingly grateful. Family and ancestors, many of whom appear in her work, ground Carol's exploration in the hinterland of human interactions and the natural world and the darker side of colonialism. 
Pam Emerson is the granddaughter of Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants who fled the Russian pogroms for New York City in the early 20th century. She has lived in the Pacific Northwest and the US for 20 years on land stewarded by the Duwamish and Squamish Suquamish people for thousands of years. She designed sustainable water infrastructure programs with the city of Seattle and pursues anti-racism learning and practice in her workplace with her communities and in movement organizing spaces. Ever since she was a kid, she has turned to writing as a tool for inquiry and self-making. She's grateful to her family, her ancestors, the land she lives on, and her many anti-racism teachers, especially Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, Nancy Luna Jimenez, Suda Nanda Gopal, and Lisa, who is here with us today. And Lisa Iverson, the editor of this collection, received her master's in social work from the University of Washington in 1992 and is a licensed independent clinical social worker. Her Bachelor of Arts degree, a double major in sociology and in English and English and minor in women's studies is from the University of Minnesota. Lisa's psychotherapy practice has been based in the Pacific Northwest. She's been a systemic family constellations practitioner since 1999, working with people from diverse lineages and faith traditions throughout the Pacific Northwest, United States and Canada. Her areas of expertise include transgenerational trauma, mental illness and families, effects of war on family, and relationships between individual collective healing, post-colonial healing, integration of indigenous and Western healing approaches, and many more ways of being. So I'm gonna stop there just because everyone is very impressive and I'm excited to get to the conversation. So without further ado, I was wondering, Lisa, if you could start by giving us a little bit of a context of how this essay collection came into being and what family constellation work is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deviani. Thank you for being our moderator. We are so grateful and honored that you're with us. Um, family constellations, systemic constellations, it's an experiential group method developed by a man named Bert Hellinger. A German man over 30 years ago, he developed this method um, on the uh, foundation of many others that came before it, ultimately inclusive of indigenous wisdom that's innate in our whole human family. And so that method really um, is an immediate experiential embodied way to access the generational histories, the influence that they have in our lives. And so that's been my primary um, field of practice for the last 20 plus years. Um, fast forward to about a year ago, um, Sonia Lee, who's one of the essayists in this um, collection, um, Sonia invited me to her region in Banff to offer a workshop around the histories that um, this collection uh, we've written about here. And the name of the workshop was called Whiteness is Not an Ancestor. And um, during that retreat, I had a dream in my nighttime that emerged that for me, I knew it was from the ancestral realms and that's where this project came from. So I woke up one morning with the, you know, it was like getting an email in your um, email box in your inbox. <laughs> that's for me how it was. So it was a pretty specific, clear plan about who to invite, what the structure is, what the timeline is, this kind of a thing. And so I, um, I listen closely to those kind of directives. And so in um, February, March of this year, I um, invited each of these um, women. I knew all of them in a variety of ways. I knew their capacity um, to write about their own lives um, and their generational histories, the role that whiteness has um, in them and um, it's been an enormous honor and privilege to get to do this with them. That's the, that's the short scoop, how we got here. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that and um, just appreciate that context. And out of this uh, amazing collection, I had the privilege of speaking to two of those SAS, Carol and Pam. And I'd like to just invite um, Carol and Pam to do short readings from their work. I also, forgive me, just want to situate myself if that's okay before we continue. Um, I'm a, a mixed race uh, Punjabi Jewish individual with my pronouns are she, her. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Carol, you have a beautiful essay, In Mountain Light, Walking with My Grandfather. Would you read us an excerpt? Yes. Um, I'd like also to mention um, 
that my essay talks quite a bit about the uh, Indigenous uh, community in Morley um, between Bath and Calgary. Uh, that is the Stony Nakoda Nation and is comprised of three families. And the references in my essay are um, largely about uh, that particular group of First Nations, although the Rockies in general have had many um, First Nations uh, involvement and territories within them because it's a you know a big area but in the small area I lived in in Banff that would have been the um, the individuals being referred to are from that nation or from the Windermere Valley area um, in the Columbia Valley. So that's a long-winded way to start reading. Layers of conflicting truth are a hallmark of colonialism itself the tool of whiteness. Land which has been taken is considered the property of those who took it. Accounts of exploration and discovery in the 19th and early 20th centuries are even now described as though those areas were not already known to indigenous people who sometimes provided maps or served as guides for eager explorers. There remain a few unceded tribal lands within Banff National Park and other national park boundaries. They cannot be legally occupied, but one can occasionally see a teepee among the trees. The store with pictures, 1952. My grandpa took pictures of the mountains. He built a big building with pictures all along the top of the walls and hanging from the ceiling and up and down the posts that hold the roof up. Now dad prints those pictures in a room with spooky red light. Grandpa's pictures tell me stories, like Ike Mills talking to his dog friend who has his paws on Ike's shoulders. Ike's stable is out back behind our store and I go there to watch his horses. There's one picture of Ike pulling porcupine quills out of his dog's nose while he sits there with his eyes closed. He sure does love Ike. I never met grandpa cause he died before I was born, but mom did. His ghost was sitting on the steps of his old house the first day she came to Bath. She said he just wanted to check her out. I wish his ghost would visit me. I've been walking with my grandfather all my life. How could I not with his pictures surrounding me every time I visited dad at work? Among my favorites were a grouping of hand colored portraits of indigenous people who live near Banff. As a young girl, I wondered why in some pictures, people seemed sad or seemed to glare at me. In others, they rode on beautiful horses and wore white jackets with long fringes on the sleeves and flowers made of beads. Now I have different questions. What did they think of this man who was taking their pictures? Did they agree to be photographed? Was he asked to photograph or given permission the subjects didn't agree with? Always the relationship between photographer and subject is at issue. John Hunter, Chief Sitting Eagle, appears in many of Byron's photographs of the Bath Indian days that were held yearly from 1894 to 1978. Byron also photographed Chief Sitting Eagle preparing for the Sundance, a sacred ritual of initiation and healing. It, like many other indigenous ceremonies, was forbidden and criminalized under the Indian Act of 1885. This prohibition would not be dropped from the act until 1951, but the ceremonies continued in private. My father told me there was a whole series of Byron Sundance photographs. Dad lent them out at some point and they were never returned. He couldn't remember or wouldn't who they had belonged to. I've always wondered why Byron was allowed or perhaps invited to attend and document this most private, most sacred of ceremonies. 
What was his relationship with Chief Sitting Eagle? Photography is a child of the Industrial Revolution. It is impossible for me, despite years as a nature photographer, following in the footsteps of father and grandfather, to see this technology or art form, however it is applied, as neutral, as benign. Thank you very much for that. Um, part of my instinct wants to ask you a question now, but I, I think I may just ask Pam to read Carol first, and then I'll come back to it after both of you have read. Yes. Thank you for that. Pam, would you be able to share your story from leaving Mitzrayim? Thank you, Devyani. And um, I'd, I'd like to just reiterate a land acknowledgement as well before I begin. So I'm I'm in Seattle, Washington, which of course takes, our city takes its name from Chief Self, who was Suquamish, Duwamish chief. Um, so those are, the, those are the lands that I'm a, a settler on, a guest in. Um, and I just, I just wanna name also that the Duwamish people are not federally recognized by the US government. So uh, they, don't, they don't receive um, any of the, the, the supports that other, other federally recognized tribes receive. Um, and yet they are still with us, of course, and still stewarding this land and still um, fighting for federal recognition. Um, and I also do want to name, because I'm realizing he's in the visual frame, um, I want to name the Puyallup artist who, um, who painted the piece behind me. His name is Sean Peterson, and his his um, his non-colonial name that he his artist name that he goes by is Qualsius, and um, he's a he's a, a a cultural force here in the in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, so I um, am going to read a short passage, um, and there's a little bit of background I want to share before I get into it, which is just that I'm named for my paternal grandparents. Um, my, my grandfather Pinku uh, came to the United States with his, with his parents in 1907, fleeing um, the Russian pogroms in Romania. And um, at Ellis, when they arrived in Ellis Island, our, whatever their Romanian surname was, was, um, was tossed out and we were assigned the surname Gold. And so that's just important context for this passage. In the new world, Jewish immigrants were stamped with these monikers irrespective of their profession. On this side of the Atlantic, as in Europe, Jews were considered a distinct and lesser race. Renaming us gave the dominant white Anglo-Saxon Protestant class an easy way to know and track who was who. In this scheme, my grandfather was not white. Rather, his race was recorded as Hebrew in the 1910 US census. Pinku worked stateside as an army translator during World War I, and following the war, he took the English name Peter, started a family with his br bride, Chaya, Claire, and landed a job managing a pre-existing letterpress company called Emerson Printing. In the 1930s, Peter and Claire's eldest son, my uncle Blanchard, was preparing to apply to dental school and knew that applying under this obviously Jewish surname Gold would diminish, if not ruin, his chances many professional schools had quotas that capped admission of Jews. My grandfather made the decision to assume the family business name as the family name. We became the Emersons, a perfectly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant sounding name. My uncle applied under that name, was admitted to dental school, and just like that, a few years before World War II began, we became white. In the transition from being primarily socially identified with the Hebrew race to becoming part of the white race, we traded significant aspects of our heritage for the many entitlements of whiteness. We could have one or the other, but not both, not really. Our membership privileges would now be subtly contingent on our assimilation into whiteness. The more white we became, the more opportunity we had. All we had to do to get ahead was go along. From then on, the Emersons did not look back. Peter would not speak of the quote, old country not even to share our true family name so descendants like me could trace our lineage. That name was buried with him in 1968, four years before I was born. None of Peter and Claire's three sons learned to speak Romanian nor Yiddish. They left behind the rituals of keeping kosher and keeping Shabbat and the separate milk and meat dishes my father inherited from his parents became the good China and the everyday China. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, my family supported the ideas of the civil rights movement in theory and from afar, 
as we continue to leverage the relative security and advantage our newfound whiteness, of our newfound whiteness. Easier access to higher education, better paying livelihoods, wealth enough to buy property, and social acceptance beyond the Jewish community. We lost proximity to and into intimacy with the lived experience we've previously shared with other new immigrants and to some degree with other marginalized groups like black people and indigenous Americans. Our ancestors too had been discriminated against, violently attacked, nearly annihilated. And they too had somehow found resilience enough to survive and even prosper despite multiple dislocations from land and family. But our family had something other groups did not, light enough skin to pass as white. Thank you. Thank you both um, for those readings. And um, I also just want to acknowledge that telling this, these stories is very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for engaging in conversation around it. And if anyone is uncomfortable at any point, please let me know. But I'll start with a question for Carol. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Carol, the, the history of your family is an amazing one, especially in terms of the documentation of what was the kind of the settler, settler, settler colonialism in the West and the telling of the Western narrative. You talk about, you, you say in your, your essay that the authorized story of Canadian national parks is one of pristine wilderness protected from exploitation and set aside for the enjoyment and spiritual upliftment of all Canadians. But when the, the national parks were established, Indigenous peoples were expelled from their traditional lands and even their hunting rights were denied. This is a huge question that may not be possible to answer, but how have you worked to reconcile your family's history and Byron's history in terms of that narrative with regards to settler colonialism and the realities you now know? Oh boy, that is a big question. Sure. Um, a step at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, the observations, uh, I wrote uh, um, a memoir, which is unpublished, and I had finished it and revised it before this project came up. So I've been considering and writing about these sort of things quite a bit, and I really don't have answers for them. Um, Parks Canada is now doing quite a lot to try and include indigenous voices in planning uh, within the national parks. And, you know, Canada, um, when we repatriated the constitution and did the charter of rights and freedoms and so forth, um, indigenous nations were acknowledged as partners in Canada and yet um, that has, that still has to be really implemented in any real way. And there's still very much a divide between um, worlds that I think need eventually to come together in some kind of harmony and um, joint way. I don't really know how to articulate this and I don't know if I'm answering, if I'm dodging my family's part of it, but um, I think in terms of my grandfather's photographs, they're really wonderful. I'm not sorry he took them. I think within the context he lived in, it was completely understandable that he did that. And I believe that he thought he was presenting an area of the world that hadn't been seen to people who hadn't seen it. So to deny that would be a kind, the same kind of thing that really Pam's talking about when her family came to this country and denied their heritage. You know, it's, it's part of the story. So the past, um, the past is the past. What we do going forward is what matters. We can't change the past and um, through working with Lisa and Family Constellation work and working on this project, you know, I have the perspective that um, the past is not a problem, it's a situation and how we conduct ourselves going forward is what matters that, you know, we can make choices that are more inclusive, that are more, that are less judgmental and more 
nuanced than perhaps um, were made in the past. So it's within that area of reconciliation and recognizing that we're all in this together that I think the work needs to be done. No, thank you. That is that is uh, a, that very much does address, and also I think we'll come back to kind of what are those forward steps that we can all collectively take in terms of reconciliation, whether that's our own internal or familial history reconciliation, or maybe reconciliation on a larger level. So, I'll come. Thank you, Carol. I'll come back to that. I I want to ask something to Pam, and again, these essays are both distinct, but I think we'll see the themes emerging. But. Um, Pam, you talk about passing in a way which is often not talked about mm -hmm. in terms of being a white Jewish woman and adjacent to whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, you have a very nice segment in the beginning where you talk about going to a caterer who says you would have passed, implying mm -hmm. you would have survived the Holocaust because you did not look Jewish. You could have passed mm -hmm. as an, in, an Aryan, in an Aryan conceptual way. Um, can you, you also say that that ability to pass influenced your choices and behaviors could you talk about that? And you could, could you talk about your personal experience of what it means to be white adjacent in terms of your identity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Devyani. Um, I think the way that passing influenced me, especially in the earlier part of my life was very unconscious. Um, you know, it just, it, I just went along with what I saw all everyone doing. Um, uh, in terms of you know pursuing an educa higher education, pursuing economic you know economic um, well-being for myself, um, a certain kind of job, living in a certain kind of neighborhood, I didn't I didn't really see that as racialized, and I think that's part of the bl my own blindness around what becoming white or being white is is that is that quality of not seeing. Um, so you know probably not until I was in college and even quite a bit after did I start to, to grow consciousness around, okay, now wait a minute, that's, that's a construct that holds up a whole system of harm that, you know, that I'm aligning with when I align with those, with those norms and practices, even though they might seem like quite mundane and quite innocent on the surface, getting a mortgage, going to a good school, et cetera. Um, and so now as, you know, later in life and midlife, I, I, I'm having to really interrogate some of those um, really structural choices, how I spend money, um, how, I, how I interface with basically any, any system because, because whiteness and white supremacy is so integrated into all of those systems. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, as Carol said, day by day, it's, it's a reckoning process for me. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's quite uncomfortable. It's quite agitating. Um, I can, like, I can feel it in my stomach right now, even just talking about it. Um, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's that edge of, of now with the consciousness I, I have, and, and it's in process. Um, what, how am I in choice about, about that? Um, how am I removing my, where do I have agency to remove directly my cooperation with these systems? Uh, you know, in my own day to day? And then where are my spheres of influence to maybe touch the larger, larger systems? I work in local government. So, you know, where there are, I do have direct um, uh, opportunity, even in the course of my professional life, I, I touch, you know, specific pieces of, of this, of the system that is, that is broader than just my own personal life. That's setting policies and budgets and such in, in my community. So I, I have to, you know, I'm bringing that consciousness to that work. Um, and then of course, you know, how I show up um, in, in movement spaces is a, is a whole other part of the puzzle. So it's, 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 <laughs> it's multifaceted, yeah. Thank you. I'm thinking maybe that this is an opportunity, Lisa, to bring you in as well, because Carol, both of you and Pamela are talking about a form of reconciling with self and family history. And um, as you said, Pam, and Pam, reckoning even. And Lisa, could from a kind of from your practices perspective, mm -hmm. how do you think people can? Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how, through this workshop, people come to even be able to write these histories or move through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, this part of the world, North America, um, it, this is a good time for me to say where I'm speaking from. I'm speaking from the unceded 
traditional lands of the Coast Salish people in the region that some call Cascadia, just south of the um, British Columbia border. So I'm an American. And what the reason that I say that is that uh, consciousness about citizenship in country is part of this whole process that we're in, I think, not only with this book project, but just this, this time that we're living in in 2020. So the relationship between individual and family and ancestral and national histories are simultaneous. They are concurrent. We are all these roles all at the same time. And um, the, the reason that that's important to highlight here is that the focus so much as an American and, and in, in North America is on the individual. And that's completely unnatural. So <laughs> family is where our belonging begins and it's where our, our life force comes from. And it's also these histories that are really difficult ones. It's also where there's a wellspring of strength to connect to. There's a lot of strength and resource that only can be found and accessed by um, accessing ourselves as descendants because none of us fell out of a spaceship, <laughs> you know? but we do function that way a bit <laughs> in this part of the world. And so, um, so I think that it's very important to, um, to shift our perspective toward expanding our capacities in areas that have to do with what our shared human experience is. And that is in part that we are all descendants. We're all sons and daughters and grandchildren of our grandparents. We all have ancestors. We are all future ancestors. And so whether we have children or not, we're the stewards of the web and that makes us future ancestors. So that's a lot to have in common. From that perspective, there's a lot of truth that we can acknowledge together. So groups of are where it's at, I think, um, in terms of these histories. It's not for the individual, it's for groups to do together. Thank you for that and just your insight. And I think I'll come back to Carol building on that and say, Carol, I mean, how did you come to choose to write about Byron? And um, I, I will say it sounds, you have worked with him in terms of your photography and said you have walked for, with him for a long time. I wanted to first ask what the process of writing the essay was like in, in light of what Lisa is saying as a descendant and in terms of the history that brings, sorry, there's too many questions. And secondly, this is my second part, Carol, is um, you talk about photography as an art form that has, photography is an art form that has long been about capturing those who may or may not wish to be captured. And you speak to the, can you speak to the relationship of boundaries between recording a really important history, the, um, the settling of, of Banff with, for example, artistic trespass, the idea of recording the Sundance, which was a, a sacred ceremony and other images you talked about, images from Banff's Indian days that you were proud of, but never wanted to show publicly because it was a sense of trespass. So, sorry, first is just how you came to write in the essay. And second is the relationship of photography between history and trespass. Okay. Well, I didn't want to write about what I wrote about initially. I wanted to write about, um, our relationship to the natural world, because I think that that's the first trespass is how um, we have othered the entire natural world, that we have put ourselves on a pinnacle mm -hmm. of being the top species instead of looking at the world as a network. So the Indigenous people in Canada and around the world that still have uh, living tradition of recognizing the world as a network and as everybody in it as being interconnected. 
connected plants, animals, the water, the stones, the whole thing, that that is the worldview we need. And um, they are the holders of that tradition still, which we all had at some point in our heritage and have lost, have given away. So that's what I wanted to write about. But this book is about people and culture and how we deal with things. So Lisa kept bringing up the idea of writing about the Aboriginal aspect and about photographs. And, um, you know, I eventually came around to it. And I felt one of the reasons I didn't want to write about it is I felt I wasn't I didn't have enough experience that I wasn't an expert in that area. When the Truth and Reconciliation Commission happened, I didn't go, I could have, but I didn't go to the events in Vancouver. I wasn't well at the time. And I used that as an excuse not to go. And I now really wish I had, and we have. You know, you speak about the difficulty of writing this book, but Canada now has in its public record 6,000 um, testaments of survivors of, you know, of residential schools. So anything that we say about ourselves is like, it's nothing compared to that. And I just really want to acknowledge those people. Sorry. Now, I've forgotten the second part of the photograph about photography. Well, I've always been, you know, I've always mused over the whole photography thing. You know, people trust photographs to tell some kind of truth. They always have. And, you know, they're, they do, they tell us something, but they don't necessarily tell us the truth and they don't ever tell us the whole story. So um, I continue to work with photographs but I've never been very comfortable about going around in public and taking photo photographs with people in without permission. So I've never been a street photographer and with the you know, few exceptions, I've just really kind of stuck to photographing the natural world, but that's, you know, is it okay to photograph the natural world? Why that and not people? You know, it's like, that's another aspect of whiteness that we consider ourselves different that we consider the natural world um, something that can be exploited and humans something that we should take care of. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just keeps, in one of the little things that I sent out, um, little emails uh, advertising the, the book and letting people know about these events, I talked about like uh, walking up a switchback trail and how you get each time you get to one corner of it and you turn around, there's a completely different view. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's like for me. Um, I don't know what it's gonna be like tomorrow. It's already different than it was when I first started writing this essay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Pam, I'm gonna just ask you one more question specifically to the essay and then we can talk a little more about maybe self-reconciliation, historic reconciliation and moving mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. You spot, you speak a lot about the privileges that your Jewish family kind of received through their name change to Emerson mm -hmm. and the kind of normalization of whiteness. What are your thoughts on, for white adjacent folks and even POC folks in terms of this current moment of reckoning with BLM and indigenous rights? And specifically, what are your thoughts on kind of how white Jewish folks can also look at their adjacentness to to this system of oppression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for looping back to that. Um, I think I have to answer that by by going backward a little bit first, which is to say that I think Carol said something about, you know, um, giving giving up giving up the heritage and her and her and her lineage. She didn't want to give up heritage and, and or, or something. I don't want to mis misquote her, but um, I, I, there's something I want to be clear about, which is that 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 transit, um, it, there was a thrust behind it, <laughs> and the and the thrust behind it was was harm, mm -hmm. and and was and was was a was a fleeing mm -hmm. um, from harm, and that in my grandfather and great grandfather's generation, 
and to some degree, even in my parents' generation and to some degree now, but to a much lesser degree, aligning strongly and, 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 and showing up um, uh, with our full heritage and culture was, a, was, was cause for persecution, was, was, it was dangerous. Mm-hmm. And so that, that w- was an, and you know, there was ongoing discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now <laughs> what I think is really important for me as a, you know, with holding the identity as a, as a, as a white um, Ashkenazi Jew in the diaspora is that, that I, hold, I hold both pieces, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm in that edge space between, um, you know, having that history of trauma and, and persecution. Uh, and that's not unique to Jewish people. I'll just say that <laughs> it's not, you know, special. Um, but then also, uh, also showing up and identifying as white, which and that that power is bestowed on me, irrespective of my consciousness, irrespective of work I do in the community. Doesn't matter. I, it's 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 just it's just there. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I think the, pers- the 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 history of trauma and persecution. On the surface, we say, oh, we can use that as an excuse to not embrace our responsibility to to reckon and reconcile with. The, the, the unearned entitlements of whiteness and not just that they're entitlements, they're systems of harm, right? That we're agreeing with and, and going along with. We, on the surface we say, oh, use that, we can use that as we, or we may use that as an excuse. I think it's deeper than that. I think that, and I'll just say from my own experience, it's that there's not the capacity there until some of that, some of that trauma and, and harm has been healed. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that the more I can make space in myself by doing my own healing work around that and 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 what my ancestors did experience and were fleeing it, it opens more of my humanity and it opens more of my um my capacity and it and it and it strengthens my resolve and my clarity for what my responsibility is then going mm-hmm. forward and 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 for me that's kind of the essence of freedom like actually being in choice then about what happens going forward instead of being sort of in this netherland between these two um, dynamics, neither one of which feels humane to me. You know, it doesn't feel humane to be persecuted and it doesn't feel humane to align with systems of harm um, to be safe um, or to, to, you know, to be able to have a, have a livelihood. Um, so that, that's like the, the space and, you know, in terms of, in terms of what is the work of, of me with that identity and what is the work possibly of other white adjacent folks, I, I think is, um, is that sort of twofold piece of working on my own healing so that I have more capacity, more clarity and, and more conviction, um, in myself. And then and then doing that, you know, and then like heeding, he- heeding those, whatever you know, s- almost spiritual directives that um, that 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 thrust me to 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 stop cooperating with those systems, to be showing up in a good way in solidarity with um, movements for for racial justice like Black Lives Matter. Um, but I think when I don't, if in, and I have been definitely guilty of this in my in some of my activist work in the past when I was younger. If, if I'm not bringing a ground of healing into those other spaces, I will absolutely, and I have absolutely reproduced the same patterns of harm and domination, even with, a, you know, sort of a, a desire to be helpful or a desire to be in solidarity. And that is, that's not the way. And, and, and for me, and I, and, you know, I, I cringe a little bit now looking back on my, my earlier self and some, you know, some of the ways I've showed up and, and that again, is in the, is in the past and it's part of my path. And I, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I have the consciousness I have now to not be reproducing that and showing up in, in those ways. So, um, I don't know, <laughs> does that answer the question? Very beautifully, very beautifully. And I think, you know, this is now kind of common to all Carol, Pam, even Lee said like, is you, you talk Pam about kind of sitting with the difficult and disquieting and uncomfortable questions as part of, the, the the ongoing process of, of leaving Mitzrayim, leaving bondage, leaving personal spiritual bondage, and even if it, as a descendant and as an individual. And I guess I'd like to ask, you know, Carol and Lisa also, 
what are some of the techniques you suggest uh, that you use yourselves and you suggest for other people navigating these waters, as Pam has just so beautifully expressed, in terms of, of, of reckoning with one's history and moving forward in a progressive, positive way. Lisa, do you want to go for that first? Um, I can. I, I want to see if Carol wants to go first. Do, do you have a preference, Carol? No, no why don't you go first? You want me to go first? Yeah. Um, yeah. So over the last uh, 20 years, um, I've it just organically developed for me uh, daily meditation and prayer life around my ancestors. So that has become um, a key to my uh, well-being. And um, so there's that. I think I think that um, hand in hand those practices for me with um, so many ways of being embodied in a and of course the natural world is, um, our non-human natural world is, uh, is key as well. We've really forgotten, we're in process of remembering that humanness is also part of nature. And so um, I think that those movements of being in the natural world, that help, it, it, it just naturally helps us get out of our head and more into the landscape of our human nature. <laughs> and so um, those are a few things that I would say, yeah. Carol? Um, well, like Lisa, I have a spiritual practice um, that's based in, uh, in icon Sufism. He was a uh, uh, man from India that came in the early 20th century uh, who basically started out as a Muslim and then moved beyond that to recognize, like formally recognize all paths and all being seen and unseen. And I, I think there's an aspect of what's going on that is not in the physical, like we can, we can work, we can protest, we can write, we can do things. Um, whatever we're called on to try and make things better. But I think that there's a way in which um, just as nature is controlling the natural world in a way that's way more complex than we have any idea and capable of bringing balance and um, reparation in ways that we can't possibly imagine that there's a spiritual reality that's in operation as well. Um, Pam's essay started out with a quote from Rabbi Zolman. What is expansive and uninhibited by yesterday's standards is confining today in light of added perspective and new possibilities. And I think that that was really a great way to start that essay and really worth, you know, it really made me think. Um, I think I've lost track of so I write and I uh, still work with photographs and I try to tell stories or illustrate something rather than come out with uh, a statement of how I think should, you know, my shaking finger is, you know, ever ready to shake, but I try not to use it. Um, I just launched a project with a friend and my husband called Writers Radio, and we'll be publishing um, short pieces by writers that are not well known mostly. And, um, you know, it's through things like that, through doing art, through um, trying not to sit in judgment, but to use uh, discernment rather than judgment. That's really, that's really what it is, is uh, there's no, you know, we're, we live in a very, very polarized society and everybody certainly know what's right and what's not right. And it's somewhere in the middle um, where it overlaps uh, that we'll find resolution together. Thank you all for those contributions. I'm noticing, I have uh, many more questions, but I'm noticing a lot of activity in the chat. Mm -hmm. So in a moment, I'd like to invite uh, maybe Summer to help us open up and hear from the people we're speaking with because there's 92 of them. Mm -hmm. But can I ask one last quick question? And maybe it's a little more kind of 
about intergenerational relations. It, there was an article in the New York Times the other day about kind of calling in versus calling out. And uh, a prof, I believe New York based, who has started kind of a course on calling in. Um, I'm, I, I don't, I, I just wanted your top line thoughts on as we heal, I myself am complicit in, in harm as a mixed race person with good intentions, having done some programming choices that have had effects that are not always positive. I, I believe in calling in as opposed to cancel culture, but I was just curious to your thoughts on this because I think that's a big part of also systems change and longitudinal healing. Mm -hmm. Pam, do you want to go for it first? Um, sure. Um, I, yeah, that, the, the calling out culture is definitely something I've experienced inside um, movement spaces and I have personally experienced harm from that. I, I think I've probably inflicted harm as well, probably on other, other white people, white identified people. Um, what I'm, what I'm coming, you know, the intergenerational piece is interesting because I think I say this in my essay as well, that I, when I look at the choices that my ancestors made from my, my context, I definitely have um, an impulse to, um, to re reject them and their choices and, a, and an impulse to judge them and sort of disown, disown them. And then where does that leave me? <laughs> um, you know, and their, and their context was, was quite a bit different than mine. And so I can also flip that and think, okay, they made the choices they made um, for reasons I can't, I can't understand. And maybe it was precisely those choices that have given me this little bit more space um, to see what is and to, and to begin the reckoning process. And maybe that's happening no sooner than it could possibly have happened. That's, that's possible. Um, you know, call out culture, um, I, th I think it's it's animating the same patterns we're trying to get away from. Essentially, it's it's anim or, or get beyond. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's animating patterns of um, fragmentation. Uh, it's 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 animating patterns of 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 um, othering and and um, and um, dominance ultimately. Um, so I think that's in and of itself just tactically, it's not a good way to go <laughs> um, because. Um, we're making stronger the very thing that we're we're trying to transform uh, when we do that. Thank you for your thoughts, Carol. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I agree with Pam. Actually, I don't know that I have too much more to add to that. Uh, you know, we have a human history of war, of and we have a culture that uses the language of war and the language of conflict increasingly and. Um, it's never gotten us what we've wanted up to this point. We've got to change somehow the tactics with which we work. Yeah. Lisa, do you want to comment or? Yeah, I would just add that um, anybody who's spent um, time with me in groups that I lead, have they've heard me say that we're not as original as we think that we are. <laughs> and so, um, the gift in that there's an invitation to see the way in which we're in resonance with who and where we come from and the circumstances that have already happened in ways that our western trained mind really works hard to get us to think otherwise but as pam and carol both have um just just stated um you know we might be giving it a different name now, the phrase, you know, cancel culture, calling out culture, but um, I would see that as the unclaimed um, perpetrators energy in our family systems waiting to be recognized and claimed. Mm -hmm. And that's what these women have done with what they've written about. So um, this is long-term work. And it's doable, but it's important that we um, that we see it as such. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so very, very much for this conversation. And personally, thank you for it's made my life richer. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone here, um, I'd like to invite everyone else who is here to have a chance to interact with you 
and I'm not sure if Summer is going to be coming on or um, fielding questions, but can we take questions or comments? I see about 20 in chat and one in Q&A. Yeah, so um, I'm going to kind of combine a Q&A and chat question. Um, and this is basically for Pam. Um, what are some examples of reproducing harm that you now recognize? Mm -hmm. Could you give an example of activism that came from an unhealed part? And then kind of a secondary question, um, uh, what has your experience been reclaiming the Hebrew identity and how your family reacted to that? Mm -hmm. Um, the first part, um, I, you know, I, I can identify some things at different levels. So just like interpersonally, ways that I think I've shown up in the past is pretty controlling, um, con um, sort of assuming a leadership position as a way to control the situation, um, uh, claiming leadership, not from a place of lived experience, but from a place of um, just sort of p a p position. Um, or, or straight up whiteness, um, not representing anyone but myself. So not, not coming with any sort of constituency that I'm, that I'm um, accountable to, but, but just, just my own cleverness uh, or my own, my own vision. Um, even just the way I might interact in a space, like um, speaking more, um, uh, not being appreciative of other people's contributions. I mean, there's a whole host of sort of interpersonal patterns that I think I bring. I'm working on now, but, you know, have brought more strongly in the past that I would put in the category of harm. Um, and the, the, there's a group level one as well, and this is not so much in movement spaces, but just in general, which is this, this sort of, um, this sort of fabric of innocence and sort of like, I've done enoughness <laughs> that is like just going along with what is and that I, I sort of absolve, I don't have any power in it. And I just sort of absolve myself of, of, um, of interrogating that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that sort of like doing, doing nothing um, is a, a, a big pattern of harm uh, that I, now that I, I mean, now I identify that as a pattern of harm that I'm colluding with. Mm -hmm. um, that before I think I just would have not even maybe seen a, a, let alone like embraced as harmful and something I need to reckon with. Um, so those are some examples. I'm sorry, Summer, I don't remember the second part of the question. Um, just about reclaiming um, your uh, Jewish family um, roots. Yeah. And, um, how your family's reacted to that. Oh, uh, my mother is still with us. She's 85. Uh, I don't know if she's listening today. She may be if she figured out Zoom. Um, uh, I, I think it's quite gratifying for her. Um, uh, you know, my, my siblings and I all have different relationships with our Jewish heritage. Um, I still have a bit of a wrestling with it, to be, to be honest here. I have a wrestling with the sort of patriarchal nature of it. I have a wrestling with the disconnection from land and um, sort of nature, um, nature connection. Um, I, I, have a, a dis I have a wrestling with some of the, the politics that are um, you know, that, that follow Jewish people <laughs> around, especially um, Middle Eastern politics and politi politics regarding Israel and Palestine, which I, I didn't write about in the essay because I think it's an entirely other, other essay mm -hmm. and worth unpacking. Um, so, you know, I, for spiritual practice, um, I gravitate more to contemplative practices um, from, from a host of different traditions and sit, sit with different, different folks. <laughs> um, but but I, but I am, yeah, I'm still, I think, in process with sort of coming back, coming back to Judaism, rec reconciling, reconciling the trauma, reconciling my own, my own questions. But thankfully, the tradition um, encourages uh, inquiry and <laughs> interrogation, so, and study. So, um, I think it's, I think I'm welcome there, even with all my questions. Thank you, Pam. Um, I'm also going to pull this from the chat, um, and I think this might be good for Lisa. How is it that we can create a future where building capacity isn't as necessary, where children are born with it and their world reinforces this capacity um, of availability at all times? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, 
practices that have to do with thanking our parents and our grandparents for passing life on to us. Any question that has to do with how can we make things be fill in the blank for our children and our grandchildren, I would invite consideration to turn back the other direction <laughs> to our own parents and our grandparents. There's an irreplaceable gift for the next generations when we do that. So we're right at two o'clock now. Um, do we want to keep going with some questions or we do a few more? Okay. If you're, if Carol and Pam and Lisa yeah. are mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Q&A. This question is for um, Carol. Um, uh, just, it's a comment about, you know, very effective and distinguishable difference between the voice of, between the child and the adult in your essay. Yes. Um, I'm curious as to how these distinct voices arose in your creative process. When I started um, writing my memoir, which was largely about Banff and, you know, my family's photography and so forth, um, I didn't want to explain a bunch of stuff. Like I really didn't want to write that kind of a book that says this happened and then that happened. So I was working with, um, with Betsy Warland as a mentor in the Vancouver Manuscript Intensive. And she encouraged me to write the book from the age I was when I had the experiences. So in when it came to do the essay for whiteness is not an ancestor. I wanted to include some of those, some small excerpts from those voices um, in the essay. And uh, it allowed me to kind of return to being a child, to seeing myself as a young woman, to go through the experience of waking up again, you know, of starting believing one thing. And, you know, when I was in high school, I was totally into the whole thing of the Commonwealth and all the good it was doing in the world. We had a social studies magazine in school that was, you know, really exciting to me. And I thought, you know, we were doing all these great things in the world. And then gradually, as I got older, it started to dawn on me that there were other sides to all of these points of view. So um, by looking at myself at different ages, I was able to follow that progression. Mm -hmm. Wait, I just have one more in the chat. Um, uh, so this individual says, I don't know how to speak up and advocate for calling culture as a white person with a view that is different than um, a person of color who's in leadership, who's perhaps using call out culture. Um, is that something that anybody wants to comment on? I don't know, Pam, if you would want to comment on that. Can, can you read that again, Summer? Is it, yeah. is it, is the gist of the question, like the role, the, the role of, a, or the a role of a white person when a person of color in power is in the white person's estimation is using call out? Call yes, out? correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, what I would personally do uh, and is to try to build a relationship with that leader um i think that's what i would personally do i don't think it's i don't think it's a appropriate or needed for the white person to be taking on the mantle of in a public setting trying to to do something there i don't think it, i also don't think it would work hmm. um and I don't think it's honoring of the internal ex experience and um, complexity that that person of color is likely carrying in their own leadership challenges. Um, and in the in the context of the org, I don't know. I'd have to know a lot more about the organization. But um, I know that this is something that Div Divyani has worked on a lot too. I don't maybe she has a wisdom. To hey, offer. Uh, I mean. I'm thinking, sorry, I'm just being very real, real about it. I think it is a lot situationally dependent. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it is, it does have to be relational and you have mm -hmm. to first kind of build that trust with that BIPOC leader who you're referring to. Um, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like often in this heated moment that kind of raising that publicly could be viewed as a, a moment of white fragility. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's helpful either if you really want to have an open conversation about it. So I do think Pam's suggestion of trying to build a relationship and have an honest conversation while respecting that person's energies and boundaries is, is the best way forward. And um, that's, that's what I would suggest too, just being aware of kind of um, perceived white fragility and, and forgive me, Pam, if you disagree, jump in. This is just no, I, I'm, I'm glad you said, I'm glad you said that that's, that's helping me um, sort of locate my, my own response. I think I also think it's worth saying that what's perceived as, you know, what's perceived as call out or, or um, aggressive for me comes through my white lens, right? And my own, my own lack of, potentially my own lack of inner capacity to hold any kind of strong emotion even mm -hmm. about something that's racialized. So any kind of anger, any kind of indignation or any kind, frankly, any kind of truth telling mm -hmm. I might receive as um, call out. And you know, I don't know what's behind the the I don't know the example that the the person raising the question is is holding in their mind, but I've definitely been in situations and witnessed um, white people experiencing um, a, a leader of color flat out just saying their own experience or flat out just saying um, something that they're observing that's kind of like a weather report, mm -hmm. and the white folks um, receiving that as um, aggressive or um, you know, antagonistic and, 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 and that I think is, is a very useful place for, for white folks to slow down around and kind of check their own inner capacity to hold another person's mm -hmm. truth and another person's, um, emotions and, and actually see that truth telling as a gift mm -hmm. that can, that can grow our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm so interested in call in and call out and the lines of communication around that. Can I add to that a little bit? Because I just see a question, Summer, in the in the chat, which is I'm curious of the impact on myself. I, I have to say, like, reading this work and even being part of this conversation, uh, just personally, not as a moderator, um, I want to do a lot more work on mixed race theory, to be honest, and have for a long time. I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like an unusual person who does pass in some respects, Pam, in terms of privilege and the way I present in the world. Um, but also self-identify as a POC woman who has had roles in now two uh, institutions that have historically not had women or women of color in those roles mm -hmm. in 85 to 100 year histories, a, a art, major art museum, a major cultural center in Banff. And sometimes it's been a really painful straddling point and mm -hmm. has led to good change in organizations. And also I think to unintended harm just because of the fragility of it all. So personally reading this book makes me want to work a lot on kind of mixed race theory and mixed race fragility. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. I wanted to just to say that um, the reason that the book is called whiteness is not an ancestor is because whiteness is not an ancestor. And, <laughs> you know, the, one of the living questions in, in, in American culture for sure right now is who am I if I'm not white? <laughs> you know, who am I if I'm not white? That's um, been activated and it's a good thing. And you know, so the discomfort that's there collectively is that is a little message in the collective inbox <laughs> for this part of the world that says, hey, you know, humanity was here before whiteness was and so um everything that you just both said so eloquently just made me think to say that thanks for thanks that i could say that and i think we should on 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 that also lisa and summer i'm jumping in just um, a reminder for those out there to get the book from another story mm -hmm. and read it because that is also why we're here is the book is out and please support the book and all the writers and an, an amazing independent bookstore by, by purchasing it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And it's great for book groups. It's <laughs> a really great book for book groups. Um, 
to read it together and then to talk, have a conversation with each other like we're having now about, okay, you know, what spoke to you, what rang bells, what didn't you want to read, which ones, you know, f- you know, just like the whole thing. There's no right or wrong about any of it, but it's a really good um, book to read with others so that you can talk about it with others just like we're doing. Mm-hmm. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Diviani and Lisa and Pam. And Likewise. everyone who attended today, thank you for coming. Thank you, Summer. <laughs> oh, Summer. Yes. Thank you, Summer. Thank you, the person Summer. who kept it all together. That's, that's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all of us here that we can see and not see. This will be, um, this is recorded. So I'll send a message out um, in the next day or two when this recording is up. And uh, thanks for letting others know about it. Yeah. So will it be on the CAB website? Cause I do know people who couldn't attend. I'll, I'll send a link out. I'll send okay. an email out. Great. Yeah, it'll it'll be on, it'll be on YouTube and I'll, okay. and I'll send a link Excellent. out. Yeah. Thank you. Blessings to everybody. Well. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Summer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.